Okay, this is one you picked up on uh, YouTube for me, Nicole Dumas. Um, can you talk a bit about dark pools, black bets, and city bets, please? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I noticed this on, on one of the comments and uh, and said I didn't didn't really touch on this. Um, yeah, limited time in the first interview, but I can I can definitely talk about this now. Not entirely sure what he is referring to with black bets, maybe different phrase for something I do know, but dark pools and city bets. So dark pools is um, a, a phrase that kind of an annoys me in a sense in that the dark pool in the financial market sense is basically like hosting a poker game. So you've got someone who wants to host the dark pool and then there are hopefully in your dark pool sharks and fish. And a shark, by definition, is someone who's just looking to basically, they'll often throw into the dark pool, I want to buy this share at this price. And it's a ludicrously opportunistic, you know, sort of trade they're trying to put in. And sometimes they get matched, and they get great value, and sometimes they don't. But they're generally looking to, or sometimes money will come up, and they say, well, that's clearly value. And they're just, they're just price takers in the dark pool, really. Or when they do post a price, it's, it's very, you know, quite wide of the market. And the fish in that situation are the people who want to do a large trade that doesn't appear on the actual exchange books. So people who are watching order flows on financial exchanges can see very large orders being processed as the trades get matched. And so people want to do it off book so they can get a better price. And a lot of these people are doing it for completely just, you know, they're a large pension fund, for example, that needs to buy you know, millions of shares of Vodafone or whatever it may be. And they know that they'll just get a crappy price for the overall customers who, you know, they're doing this for if they just try and lump it all through, you know, quickly on the exchange. So, you know, the idea is, is that banks generally, big investment banks who host these dark pools, they often have just huge volumes of shares swirling around within their ecosystem that they can just match up things ranging from rounding to corporate actions that have come through to these. Through. The reason why you just have this float of like the, generally the most liquid shares that sort of exist within the bank. And so they're in a situation whereby the person says, you know, you know, I need this many millions of shares, best price kind of thing. And the bank can facilitate. Bank makes good money, customer's happy, everyone works together. You know, so the dark pool in that sense is where there is anonymized. The thing is, is, you don't know who the person, by definition, you don't know who the person is who's put in that order in the dark pool. But generally, you look at the type of order it is. It's like the equivalent in a horse race. If you saw just someone wanting to have a massive lump on the favorite in a very stable race market, you'd be like, okay, chances are that's just a fair bet. In the same way that they can spot, like if someone wants a very small stock and they want to buy a thousand shares well away from the current market price, it's like you look at that kind of amount, it's, you know, it's probably not going to be great for us to match. But um, so dark pools, so in the concept of lots of people contributing to a dark pool in horse racing, well, that's what, that's what an exchange is, right? <laughs> that's anonymized cross-matching, essentially. Um, and the idea that there is private mini exchanges hosted by, you know, groups. I've been in, I've, I've had the dark pool discussion so many times over the years, including people like who really wanted to do a dark pool for bookmakers to hedge into. The idea would be the dark pool would be the anonymized element. So like, you know, if you're Labbrooks or 365 or whoever, and you had a massive position, you could then just put that order into the dark pool and another bookmaker or someone else could say, oh, I'm a bit light on that position. You know, yeah, I'll take it on. The reality of that situation is, is that mostly bookmakers are A, directionally liability-wise similar often because people want to bet the same things by and large if they're in the sort of the square customer category or the other things they want to hedge is things where they're already you know holding red you know they're already holding red money you know so they laid the horse to someone at 20 to 1 in the morning and you know they're now like the horse is now five to one and they're trying to hedge it at 20 to 1 and well no one's going to take the hedge at 20 to 1 um so what generally the experience has been is that no one basically what people did was they used dark pools to basically have bets themselves rather than any actual hedging functionality. Um, so, you know, the closest you get to sort of, I suppose, off, mar off exchange betting is, you know, you get private layers. That's much more common within something like horse racing. Can be commission agents who sometimes do some private laying, can just be big bettors who've got like, you know, you know you can go to if you want to have a big lump on the horse. And, and sometimes they'll take the bet purely with the view that, 
particularly with commission agents, because a lot of commission agents don't actually charge commission, they just want the info. So you get these situations where, you know, you've not placed the bet on Betfair, no one can see that you want to back this horse, but you've gone to the private layer, and the private layer gives you your fill, and then it's up to them to like, what am I going to do? Am I just going to lay it? Am I going to try and have some of it back myself? Am I going to have all of it back and some more myself? You know, this kind of thing. So that's sort of the dark dark pool element i guess sort of the off away from trying to conceal off the exchange and city bet city bet is i mean you can just google city bet into some regards and just see what people you know the illegal the illegal massive asian betting exchange that you know does x billion a year this kind of stuff there's a lot of uh sort of these kind of pieces written on it um similar sort of you know set up to to Betfair in terms of like the layout, you can go on YouTube and put in CityBet actually, and you can see some videos of just the platform, basically. Uh, similar groups who market make on Betfair are doing some market making on CityBet. There are some market makers who are exclusively CityBet. And if ever you're watching the screen, particularly on something like that, like, so if you want to do fixed odds Hong Kong Jockey Club stuff, so CityBet, you know, it's normally a tote pool, city bet you're betting fixed odds on Hong Kong Jockey. That money is kind of very concentrated, I suppose, coming out of Asia generally. And that's where that, that price is sort of circled around. Um, Betfair, you know, Betfair doesn't offer it. But then when you get something where they both Betfair and City Bet offer, so like just some, you know, standard mid-afternoon UK racing, you will see different money flows occurring across both exchanges. And anyone who wants to have a full, complete picture of what is going on, I suppose, in the marketplace at any given time, would probably need to be able to... It's going to filter in between the two. It's very hard for you to have a massive lump of money doing something on one and have no way for that ever to get across. But it, you can sort of watch it and it can sort of flicker between each other a bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, tons of money go through that, particularly for the Asian racing, anything where there is a large tote pool, Japanese, Hong Kong, et cetera, large tote pool market that you want to bet fixed odds into, you know, city bet's going to be the way to do that. Um, and yeah, there's some, there's Singapore, I think is where loosely you could say it's based. Um, but um, I seem to remember someone saying that some very smart, I think some of the real smart early market making style method, like, techniques and uh, software was originally built for city bet i think so um so yeah they're definitely um you, you'd expect it's not going to be free money betting into city bet that's for certain um so yeah so that's a little bit about it i get as i say limited time but that feels like hopefully that answers a little bit of nicole you know okay. desire for me to talk about it i guess and they try the mad satirist wants to know what's the single the single smartest thing you've seen a better or syndicate do in order to get an edge and improve their number? Single smartest thing. It sounds really boring, but uh, so there'll be conversations like among serious betters where they'll be like, okay, so we do this, 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 and then I mean, in an ideal world, we'd also do this, but that's a lot of effort. Don't know how we would do it. Don't know how we get the information, blah, blah, blah. Basically, everything that's really super smart just falls into grunt work that figures out how to do that thing that is like the step too far. So I remember someone saying that they wanted uh, a database, um, particularly darts and snooker. And it was a case of there wasn't a good repository, certainly at the time, of the data. And they wanted to know everything, like, you know, checkout percentages and, you know, which checkout they went for in different times. And then Snooker, they wanted to sort of almost have, like, stuff that they actually get computer vision or sort of computer visual scra scraping to do nowadays. But, you know, they very much wanted to sort of know ball position and Snooker. Like, literally, they wanted everything on it, which is kind of strange in a way because it's not a huge market, really. And they outsourced, they managed to find a resource with a lot of tape. So I don't know whether they've got access to some sort of Sky or BBC database, but they got a huge amount of tape. And they paid a group in, inevitably the Philippines, so often this happens, um, basically to watch every single bit of tape and record every single piece of stat, you know. And like, was that particularly smart? And, and you know, at this point, they then had a completely perfect database of information that no one else had at that particular time when they were doing this um and 
it'd be like, yeah, okay. Um, that is that the smartest thing I've ever heard. It just, it's one of those things where everyone can conceive that that would be a sensible thing to do to get an edge, but actually just committing to it. It's like in the old days, I remember you see adverts in the RP. I don't know if you still do, but people wanting tape of greyhounds or tape of all sorts of things. And you could tell that people just wanted to go through a huge volume of, of tape um, to be able to just watch it. You know, the old, the old racing watchers, like get an edge by doing that. Um, old boxing, but old boxing, it was very hard to get boxing fights all in one place, you know, and sometimes you couldn't get anything. And so boxing tape from around the world, like if you get HBO, lower card, and these kind of things. But that, again, it just falls into grunt work that you know is right. So like something that's truly incredibly smart that, you know, no one has ever thought of doing before. I, I, struggle, I struggle to think of um, something that sort of is in that category. Um, I mean, I think the drone stuff, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I think some of the, you know, the guy who first realized, you know, how to do the GPS of the horses on, you know, you know, for the drones over race courses, that, that feels like something that someone would have said in the pub. Oh, you can't do that. And then someone said, well, has anyone ever actually tried? And then that guy went away and spoke to someone who knew about drones and they did it and they're like, oh, it does work. And now we've got several seconds ahead on the in-running market. <laughs> like we're just making money hand over fist. Um, yeah, I would, I would say that like, you know, you look at all the great stories, like, you know, I don't know, like Tony Bloom, Bill Bentner, Jelko, all these monster Billy Waters, you know, it, it's like, I do like, I do like the Billy Waters in that, you know, the, this idea that he would have several handicappers who report in with numbers and he would basically have an ensemble, or what we would call now an ensemble model, but basically, you know, an aggregate of all the numbers of the handicappers who reported into him. And originally that aggregated line that he had was just brilliant. He could just beat the market hand over fist. Then the market became very wise to sort of this large winner within their midst and became very skittish. And I think the smartest thing is that Billy Waters very quickly recognized the advantage to being Billy Waters to the extent that he had the entire Vegas market petrified of like, you know, yeah, Billy's on this game, Billy's definitely on this game. And, like, and so he basically found out that, you know, now he could just push the market wherever he wanted to if he let it slip, that, you know, if he got a runner to sort of let it slip somehow that this was Billy's money, suddenly the market would move massively and he would have the other side. So I think he, he very much early on got the idea of being one man manipulation machine and just his very monetizing his reputation that way. I think um, that, that feels like a smart thing to do. And, uh, and yeah, um, yeah. Okay, this is the final question for this would be the penultimate part. I see would like to know what what's your hierarchy? Model men or pro punters? Mm, I don't know. Can can model men not be pro punters as well? Um, I I think maybe I get a little bit of what he means. Um, undoubtedly, when you have a model, you can scale. You may be blind to some very obvious. I suppose, human heuristic type elements within markets that the stats don't show up. But by and large, the best model men seem to be the ones who scale massively, can automate what they do a lot and make a lot of money consequentially. Um, do I think that people who are in charge of those kind of models are intrinsically smarter than the long-term successful pro punters who are based on intuition? No. Um, I think, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat and, and certainly in betting, betting world, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't think that, like, I think there can be an element of, you know, the moment some, you know, group of punters talking, like the moment some bloke goes, I've built a model, a model, you know, this must be, you know, now we're talking. And I think, I think that has gone a bit far. The idea that there is, um, you know, some guy, I mean, I see, I see from Ireland, right? Um, you know, the idea that there can't be someone who goes to all the point to points, you know, goes to the yards, goes around, looks, watches a million races in Ireland. The idea that that guy is like dumber than someone who builds a model for Irish racing, to be honest, building a model for Irish racing is a real 
tease of an exercise if ever there was one um but yeah the idea that that guy is like below the in the hierarchy of the model man absolutely not um it probably depends from sport to sport like model men in soccer the, the probably high level soccer probably got the advantage yeah pro punters for lower level lower liquid stuff definitely got the edge on the model men and vice versa there we go maybe that's it